not recognize or approve the cannabis plant as a medicine. And this is despite uh, many saying that because the plant contains chemicals that may help treat a range of illnesses and symptoms, many people argue that it should be legal for medicinal purposes. However, uh, I, I put this uh, picture here on the right side. This is what uh, uh, one of my patients uh, brought to me uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, the, he purchased this in a gas station in Alabama. This is uh, pure Delta-8 oil. So this is, uh, this is one of the cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. It's still not uh, approved uh, to be sold in the state of Alabama. And he had very bad reaction with multiple seizures related to this. Uh, although there is some evidence Delta-8 can treat seizures, there's only animal evidence and no human evidence at this point. So we have to be careful what, what our patients actually uh, get and where they get it. So what are the cannabinoids? Uh, there are chemicals derived from the cannabis plant or manufactured as in synthetic. And the synthetic cannabinoids are available. I can prescribe them today to patients. Ronabinol, nabilone, there are Delta-9-THC-like uh, products or analogs. Uh, so we recently completed this survey. Uh, th this was a national survey of uh, uh, nurses, neurologists, and pharmacists. Uh, and uh, over 80% of those surveys were in support of legalization of medical cannabis. However, they recognized that the, their knowledge is, um, is relatively limited. And uh, many of them felt that they uh, needed to learn more before they were able to uh, recommend a medical cannabis for any conditions. Also, about 90% felt that there was stigma associated with recommending medical cannabis. So many patients come to me and ask for the natural product. Uh, cannabis is natural product, is plant derived. And as you can see, um, 100 years ago uh, and, uh, and um, uh, even longer than that, uh, cannabis has been available. Companies like Lilly, that is um, currently Eli Lilly, or like Park Davis, uh, we're uh, uh, distributing uh, cannabis products. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this ended uh, some time ago, and we're coming back to that age of uh, being able to recommend this to patients. But we also be, need to be very careful because these products are also natural product. Heroin, opium, and LSD are natural, so we need to make sure that we understand what we're recommending and what we are discussing with our patients. We also need to be very careful about what the cannabis industry says about their product. Obviously, they want to sell their product, and they will tell you this, that there are no deaths related to uh, cannabis. However, that's not true, and they're very rare that that's related to alcohol, and uh, that's related to uh, uh, cigarettes uh, almost don't exist unless somebody develops cancer, but then, of course, they uh, die of cancer. Um, here, uh, it's, uh, if somebody develops psychosis related to cannabis, uh, they are not labeled as death related to cannabis, but they're related as death related to psychosis. So, uh, of course, we have to compare apples to, uh, to apples, not apples to oranges. We also need to understand the, the population trends. So what is happening is that uh, for the last uh, 40 plus years, uh, Pew was following the, the data regarding the uh, approval or, or the uh, population thoughts about uh, the use of uh, cannabis for medical purposes. And there was a crossover here around the year 2000 where more people, more adults, thought it should be legal than illegal. And this is uh, independent of age group, except for the silent generation. The people who are uh, close to uh, 80, 90 years old today, uh, a majority of them are against. However, you can see that 40% of the octogenarians are still uh, in support of um, medical cannabis. Um, this was 2018. You can see that this is changing dynamically from year to year. This is 2019. So again, you see the change from 62 to 67 percent. And this is independent of the age group, uh, at least uh, in those ranges. Uh, and it's independent whether you are a Democrat or Republican. It doesn't matter. That issue is very um, recognized by all, all uh, people as uh, med medical cannabis should be um, legalized. So um, we need to also understand a little bit about the endocannabinoid system, and uh, that's because uh, the cannabis and its, um, and its uh, products work through the endocannabinoid system. And we have learned a long time ago that modulating the endocannabinoid system 
uh, false therapeutic potential in a broad range of diseases affecting humans. And that modulating the endocannabinoid system and its activity can help with various conditions. And um, many of you may, uh, may say, okay, how is it that one little plant is helping so many things? And the answer to that is actually, uh, it's not one little plant. It's about 500 different uh, chemicals that are in that plant. If you do an extract or if you use it as a cigarette or if you use it as a vaping product or if you use it as a brownie. So uh, depending on the content of the cannabis and at which level that content works uh, in, the, in the human body, the effects may be different. And uh, but here we see the differences in how the cannabinoids work in a human body. And although this is uh, divided between desirable and undesirable effects, um, these effects are really for medical purposes. And the, the talk today is not for recreational purposes. Depending on the level of, of human body where they, uh, where they act, uh, so either, whether this is a CB1 receptor in the brain or CB1 that is peripheral, or CB2 stimulation, or again, inhibition of the endocannabinoid metabolism of transport, the effects are different. And we can use these differences uh, to stimulate the desirable effects and avoid the undesirable effects uh, in, uh, when using cannabis as a medicine. Um, the imp important things, at least for me as a neurologist, is of course the pain, treatment of anxiety, treatment of inflammation, um, these are the undesirable effects which I'm trying to avoid. And for me, uh, as an epileptologist, the important uh, aspect is that cannabinoids decrease, decrease cortical excitability and e increase inhibitory tone, meaning that they uh, act as anticonvulsants. When we, uh, when we talk about cannabinoids, we need to understand that they are very different than other pharmaceuticals and that um, we have a biphasic and bidirectional response to uh, using cannabinoids. So let's say about uh, when we use it for mood control, uh, at, some, at some small dose, the, the effect is positive. As we are decreasing the dose, instead of getting better response, we may be actually seeing a uh, neutral uh, response or no response at all. And then if we continue to increase it, the response may be negative. For seizure control, that's what I do. Uh, is uh, you can see improvement in the beginning, but then you at some point see best response and of course worsening of the symptoms uh, later. And we've seen this several times in patients who were in cannabidiol trials where we reached that, that sweet spot. And then if we continue to decrease, increase the dose, the efficacy decreased. So um, the sweet spot, we talked about it. Uh, the cannabinoids upregulate the endocannabinoid system at acute and lower doses and they downregulate the endocannabinoid system upon persistent agonism. So uh, as you continue using it on a daily basis or very frequently. And that individual responses will depend on the variety or strain of the, of the product, dosage, dosage and uh, route of administration, personality of the patient and the degree of tolerance and where it is uh, um, grown and um, uh, how this is processed and many other factors that are very difficult to control. There's also tolerance that may develop and the tolerance develops as a function of the CD1 receptor. Uh, and with chronic use, uh, we see that the benefits derived from especially the use of Delta 9 THC with regard to mental health um, could uh, result in worsening of symptoms if you uh, withdraw the Delta 9 THC. So there is a certain habituation to the effects, and if you remove the delta nine THC, there may be worsening of the of the symptoms. Uh, we also need to understand one very important thing, and there are multiple studies uh, to that effect. These are probably the two most important ones. Uh, the first one is by Van Dre uh, that looked at products available in dispensaries in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and, and uh, Seattle. They looked at seventy five edible products, and uh, what they discovered is uh, whether those were uh, lollipops or brownies or oils, um, the accuracy for the THC content was only 17%. So one out of six, uh, 47 products were labeled uh, and one out of six was, uh, was labeled accurately. For the non-THC, which was mainly CBD, um, uh, 44 pr uh, products had detectable CBD levels, but only 13 were labeled as, um, as containing CBD. 
and 0% of them were accurate. Uh, this is very important. If we're using something for, um, for medicinal purposes, we really need to know and understand what our patients are receiving. This is not reliable enough for us to uh, make recommendations of these products. Uh, this is another study by the same group uh, two years later after the cannabis industry said that they uh, have um, uh, gotten their act together and uh, have better products. And maybe there is some improvement, but this is not significant. When you look at oils, tinctures, and uh, vaping liquids, you see that uh, the oils are best. One in two are, uh, are labeled correctly. Tinctures, one in four. Uh, vaping products, one in eight. So overall, about uh, one in three products are labeled correctly. This is not good enough for medicinal purposes. So we need to have a better uh, mechanism of monitoring the content and making sure that what's um, in the bottle is also what's on the bottle. And that brings us to the patient that, that I have. This was actually right before pandemic. I saw the patient uh, who uh, brought in these four bottles and uh, he just did not understand that the first one was uh, great, no side effects, it worked great for the patient. This one, uh, he sort of felt uh, slow, but it worked. Um, uh, probably was stone, maybe there was some THC in it. Uh, this product didn't work at all, and this one didn't work either, but had some side effects uh, as well. So the question is, of course, what was, whether, whether what was in the bottle was also on the bottle, and we don't know that because we can't really test these products very well. So, um, Many patients also ask the very important questions. How is, how is uh, cannabis, whether used for medicinal or other purposes, uh, affect their cognition? And uh, there are great studies, but this is probably the most comprehensive one that used data from uh, several thousand patients, um, cannabis users, over 2,000 of them, and uh, about uh, 6,500 uh, of comparison subjects. The important part is that if you are a daily heavy user, of recreational cannabis, you can have negative effects on cognition. However, after, uh, after 72 hours of, uh, of stopping the use, so right here, uh, these effects uh, mostly go away. So this is not a permanent effect, this is a temporary effect uh, that can be alleviated by, by stopping the medical cannabis. The, the major concern that uh, people have is actually driving and operating any type of machinery with with um, um, cannabis, whether it's used for um, medicinal or recreational purposes. So there are two great studies, those are Australian studies, uh, where patients were in the first one randomized in a crossover design to receive either THC or uh, THC CBD, a product that had um, equivalent uh, potencies of both, or placebo. So they basically received about 13, 14 milligrams of THC per dose uh, of this product and of this product. Uh, what was important is that uh, the active products, so THC and uh, THC CBD, uh, negatively affected driving performance. So the patients were uh, waving, uh, weaving in the lane, um, and um, uh, that lasted for up to um, three and a half, four hours after a dose. And there was no difference between just the THC product and THC CBD product. So there was really no protective effect of CBD in this case. Uh, uh, all the other cognitive testing also returned to baseline within uh, three to four hours. However, um, when, when the patients were asked, they, uh, the patients who were receiving Delta 9 THC felt stone while uh, these patients did not. They also uh, repeated this study in some ways in 2020, but used a randomized control trial design with a vaping product. So it was uh, either Delta 9 THC or THC CBD or CBD or placebo, and they transitioned patients from one group to the other, so it was a crossover design. And they also looked at driving performance, and again, the products that contained THC, the patients had at least uh, one to almost two hours of driving impairment, similar to this one which was uh, weaving in the lanes. So clearly, uh, the acute use uh, should uh, stop uh, patients uh, from, from uh, operating motor vehicles for at least uh, two to four hours. So uh, the second part of the talk is about the data that are uh, available in support of the use of various products uh, for the treatment of human disease. So these data were published actually by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine 2017. So those are data 
up to 2016. Um, and I'm um, using these data with, <coughs> sorry, uh, with support some newer data that were published since then. Uh, this report was, uh, was supported financed by CDC, by uh, National Highway Safety, uh, Traffic Safety Administration, by NIH, by FDA, and uh, several others. Those are the most important ones. We actually summarized these data uh, in a little bit more detailed and updated form um, in 2020. This was published. So uh, let's start with the with the uh, um, evidence that that we uh, that we have available. And it's uh, I'm going to start with with one statement. It's impossible to follow all the data because uh, I gave uh, a, a version of this talk about two and a half weeks ago to a UAB Psychiatry. And since then, I was able to find a few additional studies that uh, require me to update this talk. So every few weeks, uh, uh, there need, there's a new batch of data that is released. There's huge interest in this field, and uh, there are huge uh, um, amounts of data that are being uh, uh, produced. Uh, these are the conditions that are approved in a, a SB uh, 46, so that law that was signed um, by Governor Ivey in, uh, in, in June. Um, and you can sort of list this list, list uh, uh, go through this list. We're going to go through all of these conditions, uh, one after the other. Uh, so I want to start with anxiety. Uh, again, that was, uh, the conclusions are not in the a, in a same sequence as they were presented in that book. Uh, there's a reason for that. I just want to go through uh, uh, these conditions uh, that, uh, that have the data um, and, uh, and um, share that with you. So uh, at, at that time, in 2017, there was limited evidence that cannabidiol was an effective treatment for the improvement of anxiety symptoms. So um, the cannabinoid signaling is very important for control of stress, fear, and anxiety. So providing cannabidiol uh, probably affects uh, this signaling. Uh, both uh, anxiety and fear memory processing um, is uh, regulated by the endocannabinoid system. And of course, that endocannabinoid system ensures that the response to those symptoms is, uh, uh, is uh, buffered. So CBD has shown uh, to have anxiolytic, antipsychotic, and neuroprotective properties. And the Delta-9 uh, THC uh, can mitigate anxiety at lower doses. But unfortunately, it increases anxiety in, uh, in higher doses. So it's, a, it's a very important that if somebody is using THC for anxiety, that they know their, uh, their sweet spot. Um, the, there is substantial animal evidence in support of the use of cannabinoids for the treatment of mental health, but in many cases, human data are still missing. However, there are still several trials um, uh, registered uh, that are starting and all ongoing with clinical trials on dog, and we have a lot of data uh, from, uh, from Israel that uh, are available in the literature. So uh, the CBD and anxiety. There's there's a conclusive evidence from animal animal studies that uh, that anxiety works uh, that CBD works for uh, PTSD, uh, general anxiety disorder, OCD, and the situational anxiety disorder, uh, and it does not have um, properties that would produce anxiety. Um, and the CBD reverses the anxiogenic effects of the delta nine THC. So in many studies, uh, patients receive typically a small dose of CBD in addition to THC. This is uh, what is studied uh, just to decrease the uh, anxiogenic properties of THC. Uh, in human studies, a single dose of, uh, of uh, CBD at the three to 600 milligrams um, induced anxiety in individuals without anxiety. So we have to remember that people who don't have anxiety can have anxiety induced with a small dose of, uh, of uh, CBD but it actually helps patients who do have anxiety. There are very few studies, uh, if any, of chronic dosing. Um, CBD is also associated with greater improvement on anxiety factor compared to placebo in patients uh, who uh, uh, are simulated to, to perform public speaking. So if I was an anxious person, I would take a dose of uh, CBD and uh, hopefully I would do better um, and be less anxious when performing the, the uh, presenting to you. So uh, that conclusion was in the end that cannabis or cannabinoids may be an effective treatment for anxiety symptoms. What's the role of Delta-9-THC in anxiety? So there are actually four trials 
that uh, in, uh, in all uh, combined 300 and, uh, 232 uh, participants, those are trials of dronabinol, nabilone, or nabiximol. So nabiximol is actually, these, these two are synthetic, the dronabinol and nabilone. Nabiximol is actually a natural product. Uh, it's a uh, um, product available outside of the U.S. Um, it's a uh, one to one CBD THC product, about two and a half milligrams of THC, two and a half milligrams of CBD. Um, and um, there were clearly uh, uh, data showing that uh, um, there was a greater, great uh, short-term benefit of cannabinoids over placebo. But again, these studies did not have any long-term data. Uh, there's one very interesting study that is, again, um, um, underscoring the importance of uh, the, uh, appropriate dosing. So it's a comparison of uh, placebo versus delta-9 uh, THC as a single capsule, 7.5 milligrams versus 12.5 milligrams. So relatively small doses. These are, these are doses uh, that are um, in a medicinal range rather than in recreational range. And the 7.5 milligrams reduced the, the negative uh, anxiety responses, while 12.5 milligrams actually increased anxiety. So clearly, there's a sweet spot somewhere between 7.5 and 12.5 uh, and and milligrams for the treatment of anxiety. So there are also registry data for anxiety and depression. So this is from California. This is from a few years ago. Uh, again, there are many more patients now taking uh, uh, cannabis products for anxiety and depression in, in uh, the Western state. Uh, about 40% of patients reported using cannabis to relieve anxiety. Uh, and uh, so one in, uh, uh, one in two, one in three patients. However, only about 13% reported anxiety as depression um, uh, as reason for authorizing the medical uh, cannabis. So clearly patients are taking medical cannabis for multiple reasons, uh, but in about 40% of uh, patients, anxiety uh, and depression are, is one of them. In a study from, from Washington state, 60% uh, of patients were taking it for anxiety, 50% for depression. So over, obviously there's an overlap between anxiety and depression. And, uh, about 60% of patients reported uh, that um, uh, they, uh, they uh, had improvement of symptoms with using the medical cannabis. Uh, finally, a few other studies uh, that are very important, uh, especially if you are uh, treating uh, pa pediatric patients. And this is, this is recreational use, but um, uh, at least the same cautions should be used uh, when, when considering the um, recommendation uh, of medical cannabis for children. So the important um, uh, project was, this was from almost 20 years ago. Uh, there were 44 schools in the state of Victoria in Australia, 1,600 students, and they were followed for seven years. So 14, 15 years old followed for seven years. Uh, about half of them, a little bit more than half of them reported uh, cannabis use at some time, so recreational use and 7% were daily users. And when you look at the data from the US, uh, depending on the state, uh, it's somewhere between five to 10, five to 15% of uh, children of this age are using um, uh, recreational cannabis. Um, what is important is uh, that um, some portion, 71 uh, male students and 188 female students reported depression and anxiety. And in women, but not in men, daily use uh, was associated with increased risk of having depression and anxiety, and weekly use uh, was also, but at a lower rate associated with developing depression and anxiety. Uh, what is important is that the existing depression and anxiety did not predict later use uh, of, um, of, uh, medical, of, of cannabis. Uh, it is not clear whether these, uh, these um, uh, teenagers here, uh, and then later uh, young adults, um, actually had uh, some predisposition to develop anxiety and depression, uh, but clearly this is something of, of concern and we need to be uh, very clear when we're discussing this with patients. And finally, depression this is an, a, a very important study uh, that was uh, uh, performed in 1800 patients. This is again, observational study. This is data from a uh, relief app uh, where patients reported their responses to, uh, to a product they use. Uh, there were about 6,000 uh, uses of cannabis in patients who um, had depression, worsening of their depression, and they used the cannabis to alleviate those symptoms. 96% uh, 
experienced some uh, symptom improvement or relief. Um, so there was a substantial um, uh, reduction of symptoms by about four points on a scale from zero to 10. It was independent of uh, which ke uh, chemovar they used. Um, and uh, the delta-9 THC levels were the strongest independent uh, predictors of symptom relief. Um, so THC is important, at least in this study, for the treatment of the depression. However, there are some negative symptoms. About 20% of users reported uh, feeling unmotivated and, um, and uh, potentially increased depression later, which are typical side effects of uh, cannabis use. However, another 65% uh, reported feeling happy, optimistic, peaceful, and relaxed, which are also typical uh, effects of uh, recreation, recreational use of, uh, of cannabis. So uh, these results suggest some potential acute effects, uh, but of course we have no long-term effects, uh, or no long-term long long -term benefits studies. So the next uh, condition is autism. And autism was not actually represented in a National Academy of Sciences report. Uh, however, it is uh, a part of the conditions or one of the conditions that uh, have been approved for the treatment of um, um, with medical cannabis. So the animal studies suggest very significant correlation between endocannabinoid system function and pathogenesis of uh, autism spectrum disorder. One of the important studies is from 2019, so it was not included in the report. Uh, there was a prospective observational study of 188 children uh, who uh, received uh, uh, combination of uh, CBD THC 20 to 1 and with the 155 children having six months data 87 80 84 percent reported significant or moderate improvement this is typically their parents in, uh, reporting improvement uh, in behavioral symptoms Dr. Goldstein who is a um, cannabis um, um, provider in, in California she's an ER doctor who uh, has also outpatient uh, cannabis practice uh, she described 27 uh, patients in her practice who uh, uh, were recommended medical cannabis, and the 17 out of the 27 had improved behavior, were calmer, uh, there was less self-mutilation and better focus. Uh, her impression was that lower CBD THC ratio, so let's say 1 to 1 or 5 to 1, um, may be overstimulating. So uh, sh her suggestion was to use a little bit more THC, however, this may go against uh, some other data. So what do we, uh, what do we know? Um, there are multiple studies listed uh, on clinicaltrials.gov. One of them was just published recently, used cannabis uh, 20 to 1 CBD THC. This was a study designed, so this was a crossover study. Patients received either placebo or pure cannabinoids, uh, which is basically synthetic product, whole plant extract, uh, and they were treated for 12 weeks and then uh, a washout period transitions to a, another treatment, um, treatment uh, uh, type. Uh, and uh, clearly there were, there were improvements. There was improvement in disruptive behavior uh, in 40%, 49% of the cannabis group versus 21% in the placebo group. There was also improvement in uh, social responsiveness uh, by about 14 uh, points in the cannabis group versus only about three and a half points in the placebo group. However, in pure cannabinoids, um, um, there were more adverse events than in a whole plant extract. So this is THC versus, uh, versus um, THC plus CBD. Um, so chronic pain. This is probably one of the most frequently, uh, frequently uh, requested uh, uh, conditions uh, for patients uh, to uh, uh, request a medical cannabis. And there's substantial evidence that cannabinoids are an effective treatment for pain. I, I don't need to spend time on this. This is uh, obvious knowledge, a Cochrane database, published extensive review of the data uh, with, in, in support, uh, and there are multiple uh, randomized controlled trials of various products, so there's no question about that. This was also at the same time, a, independently of that first um, study, uh, second uh, study or report was published, uh, meta-analysis as well, basically saying exactly the same. However, both of them uh, stressed uh, the importance of long-term data, which at that time were not available, and we still need to have studies that have long-term uh, data collections going beyond a few weeks uh, or, uh, or 12 weeks at the most. There's also a substantial uh, support of using 
uh, medical cannabis for cancer-related pain. So um, patients who have inadequate analgesia related to uh, but when they're using chronic opioids, um, uh, they were randomized in this study uh, to receive either Delta 9 THC CBD extract or THC uh, extract only or placebo. And uh, what is important is that compared to placebo, the Delta 9 THC CBD extract showed a significant improvement uh, on the pain scale, but THC only showed a non significant change. So it's very important that, uh, at least for <coughs> I'm sorry, for the treatment of pain, there is a combination between THC and CBD, uh, and uh, both are present in, in a recommended treatment. Um, cancer therapy. So many patients, or there are anecdotal reports uh, on the internet, we can find almost anything on the internet these days, um, suggesting that, uh, that um, uh, patients or somebody used uh, cannabis and helped their cancer. Uh, the conclusion is that there's insufficient evidence uh, for, uh, for support of using medical cannabis to treat cancer. There are animal data in support of using uh, solid uh, tumors uh, with um, cannabis extracts, hepatocellular carcinoma, gliomas, uh, non-small cell lung carcinomas, breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, GBM or glioblastoma multiforme, which is a very bad uh, brain cancer or metastatic cancer. There are also two other cannabinoids, so not THC and not CBD, but cannabichromer and cannabigerol, uh, that are uh, being uh, trialed for the treatment of anti-cancer, uh, for the treatment of cancer in the pancreas. Uh, but this is not uh, finished and uh, the data have not been published yet. So uh, the animal studies um, have not been translated into human data. So that's why the National Cancer Institute clearly says cannabinoids may have benefits in the treatment of cancer-related side effects, but doesn't really say anything about treatment of cancer. The American Cancer Society has actually a whole page devoted to, uh, to uh, looking into the treatment of cancer. And uh, they actually say, all that, say that inhaled cannabis helps for all these conditions. Uh, they also say that there are no studies of uh, uh, marijuana oil or hemp oil or uh, basically what is uh, sold typically as the, as the uh, cannabidiol oil for the treatment of, uh, of cancer. Um, there's also some evidence that cancer can help with uh, tumor uh, cell growth. Uh, however, uh, this is the data have not been translated from the dish in the laboratory to human yet. Uh, chemotherapy and um, um, uh, nausea and vomiting. So there's conclusive evidence that uh, that the cannabis uh, works uh, in these conditions uh, that has been reviewed several years ago um, in Cochrane database and there are multiple randomized controlled trials uh, showing that uh, uh, cannabis may be useful for treating refractory chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. A uh, very clear message that it uh, does work in, in this setting. Anorexia and weight loss. So uh, there is um, limited evidence that cannabis and oral cannabinoids are effective in increasing appetite and decreasing weight loss. It doesn't mean that they cause weight gain. They decrease weight loss in patients with HIV AIDS, and there is insufficient evidence uh, in support or refute the conclusion that cannabinoids work for cachexia uh, or anorexia nervosa. And um, I, what is important is to understand that there is a potential for CBD, uh, in, in the treatment of anorexia nervosa uh, because theoretically it should work uh, as several studies have uh, uh, been already proposed uh, to study the role of CBD in regulating meal time in anorexia nervosa. Uh, however, the data are not there yet and uh, it's hard to recommend um, using uh, cannabinoids for the treatment of anorexia nervosa. Uh, treatment of epilepsy, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting question because uh, uh, in 2017, uh, the, uh, the report said there's insufficient evidence to support or refute the conclusion that cannabinoids are an effective treatment uh, for epilepsy. Today, we know that there are six placebo-controlled trials of cannabidiol all conducted by uh, Greenwich Pharmaceuticals. This is a pharmaceutical-grade um, plant-derived product. Uh, there are multiple open-label studies. We have summarized this uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, multiple studies have been published since then. All of them are positive. 
there's no question about that. Uh, and there's always a question about the entourage effect, so the synergistic effect between CBD and THC. And at least one study suggested that there may be uh, some synergistic effect when you're using the CBD rich extract from, uh, from like 20 to 1 or 50 to 1. There is about 71% improvement versus the uh, um, purified CBD, uh, so product like, um, like Epidiolex from GW. Uh, that efficacy is somewhat lower. However, we also need to understand that the placebo effect in neurology, this is, this the 46% is from, from randomized controlled trials, 71 is from open label trials, and the placebo effect in, in neurology is about 25%, which basically makes this equal. However, the important part is that if you use that CBD rich extract, you actually need to use much less of the cannabis product uh, which results in typically less side effects. Um, next condition is plasticity associated with multiple sclerosis and spinal cord injury. Um, at that time, there was insufficient evidence to uh, support um, any statements for or against the medical use of cannabis for these conditions. Um, since then, we had uh, several trials that was published. This is a crossover placebo controlled trial of smoked cannabis for spasticity in multiple sclerosis, relatively small trial. However, there was a clear reduction in the spasticity by uh, 2.7 points reduction in pain. However, there was also some reduction in cognitive performance. Another study, this was a randomized controlled trial, um, uh, the Savant trial. This was a, a trial of um, Nabiximals, which is again, uh, I mentioned this before, one-to-one -one, uh, CBD THC, about two and a half milligrams of each. Uh, patients uh, were able to use that uh, up to four times a day, which is relatively small dose of THC. And the results are very clear. This is the group that received uh, Nabiximals. This is the group that received placebo, and this is the improvement in their spasticity. So again, there's, there is a placebo effect. There's no question about it. However, the tr active treatment effect is uh, very uh, prominent and much stronger than the placebo effect. There's another study of spinal cord injury that I wanted to uh, bring up to your attention. This is a study of dronabinol, which is the synthetic THC. And there was a clear uh, decrease in, uh, in spasticity in patients who received uh, the product versus placebo. Um, this, this, uh, the improvement was uh, similar, whether this was an oral dosing uh, or rectal suppository. Um, and um, uh, clearly the dose that was required was somewhere in that range of 10 to 20 milligrams uh, per day to reduce the spasticity. Again, this is a relatively small dose, uh, typically much smaller than the doses that are used for recreational purposes. So overall, there are uh, uh, data regarding the synthetic uh, Delta-9 THC are insufficient, but really encouraging for the treatment of spasticity after spinal cord injury. And clearly this should be uh, further investigated. Tourette syndrome is one of the conditions that is uh, approved in Alabama law. Uh, at that time, the, uh, in, in 2017, uh, the, uh, the uh, report said there's limited evidence that THC capsules are an effective treatment for improving symptoms of Tourette syndrome. Uh, since then, Tourette Association of uh, America uh, has uh, sponsored several ongoing trials to address the question of using cannabinoids for the treatment of Tourette syndrome. Um, there is only one trial that, uh, that really reported some of the data. It's reported as a completed. Um, uh, the data were reported only in, uh, at meetings uh, and not in a published form, so they are not available yet. Uh, there are two studies that really strongly support the use, at least uh, for short term, uh, but they are very small studies. The, the first one, uh, this is German studies, had 12 adults and single dose trials, so they received single dose, and there were improvements in complex motor tics. And then there was a randomized control trial where the patients were receiving the cannabinoid for six weeks, um, and there was also a significant improvement or towards improvement in all of the scales that were tested. Uh, including a significant improvement in the Tourette symptoms, uh, symptom list, which was the primary outcome. So clearly, uh, there, is, there are data suggesting that uh, cannabinoids, especially Delta-9 THC, should work for the treatment of Tourette syndrome. ALS, um, again, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease is one of the conditions that uh, is approved in Alabama. 
uh, currently uh, or at that time in 2017, there was insufficient evidence um, uh, to support the use of cannabinoids for the treatment of symptoms associated with ALS, which is mostly my, uh, muscle spasticity. However, in 2019, a study was published again using the nabiximals, uh, and there was a clear improvement in a, in a modified Ashworth scale, which is this measure of spasticity, where patients who received the active product or nabiximals uh, improved, while patients who received placebo deteriorated. The deterioration in, in uh, ALS is anticipated, so this was not that the placebo caused them to get worse, it's just a progression of the disease. The nabiximal was well uh, tolerated, um, uh, the, there were no serious events. So clearly, uh, more data um, became available since the um, uh, National Academies of Sciences report. Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is one of the conditions that is also proved in, uh, in um, uh, Alabama law. However, the conclusion at that time was there's insufficient evidence that cannabinoids are an effective treatment for the modern symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, there are substantial preclinical data that support the development of cannabis products for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And American Parkinson's Association had a panel um, that, um, that discussed this and sort of what needs to be implemented in the studies. Uh, several states these, uh, list Parkinson's disease as an approved condition. However, when you look at the data, uh, the data are all over, uh, meaning that a study of a cannabis extract show no effect on dyskinesia. Another study of smoked cannabis improved moderate and non-moderate scores. Uh, the non-moderate scores for sleep and pain in patients with uh, Parkinson's disease. Another study said that CBD may control REM behavior disorder. Another study looked at CBD and uh, 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 the fact it, uh, showed that, that there's decreased psychotic symptoms. Uh, you can go on and find, uh, find another 10 or 20 different studies that uh, uh, with the data all over the place, depending on what you look at and what you use. So there's no clear answer to whether the, the cannabis products work or don't work for um, Parkinson's disease or symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease. Finally, the dementia. At that time, there was limited evidence that cannabinoids are ineffective treatment for improving the symptoms associated with dementia. Uh, there was a 2015 study in neurology that clearly showed that Delta-9 THC had absolutely no effect on the neuropsychiatric symptoms of uh, Alzheimer's uh, dementia. And this was a randomized uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trial. However, there's at least a theoretical consideration that CBD as an anti-inflammatory um, um, uh, molecule uh, may help with, the, with Alzheimer's disease and memory issues. And this, is, uh, this has been studied and is under development. We don't have an answer today. Traumatic brain injury. Is there any evidence that, uh, that cannabinoids help traumatic brain injury? Uh, so there's limited evidence, evidence of a statistical association between cannabinoids and better outcomes. So somebody who comes to emergency room with traumatic brain injury, if they were uh, cannabis users and have tox screen positive for cannabis, they're more likely to have a better outcome than somebody who has not been a cannabis user. This is the study. This is from UCLA. However, we can't put everybody uh, in a society on cannabis uh, to decrease the risk of mortality with, uh, with traumatic brain injury. So unfortunately, this study is not very helpful. And this is the, this is the, the best data that we have. However, at least theoretically, uh, CBD should be uh, very helpful because it's anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective. Uh, and there are multiple animal studies showing that, um, that there is some efficacy uh, to that effect in, in animals. Finally, addiction. Uh, so uh, many psychiatrists ask the question, okay, what is the role of uh, cannabis uh, for the treatment of addiction? And at that time, the statement was that there is no evidence to support, refute, or, or to refute the conclusion that cannabinoids are an effective treatment for achieving abstinence in the use of addict, addict, addictive substances, which is mainly, mostly crack cocaine. There are several studies looking, that, uh, looking at that issue there's probably at least more than 10, if not more, uh, studies looking at trying to replace uh, heroin or cocaine with uh, medical cannabis. And there's clear evidence that um, the participants decrease their use of crack cocaine or heroin. However, they don't stop. So, um, so there is improvement in their usage, but there is no resolution of the abuse. 
So uh, we don't have very good data in support of using uh, medical cannabis for the treatment of addiction at this point, at least. Sleep disorders, there's very clear evidence that uh, cannabinoids help uh, in patients with sleep in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, and multiple sclerosis. Uh, and that's not disputable, so I'm not gonna go into the data. The PTSD is uh, it's very important question because there are a lot of reports suggesting that, uh, that cannabinoids, uh, especially THC, can help the symptoms of PTSD. There's limited evidence that nabilol, which is a cannabinoid, is effective for improving symptoms of PTSD. And that is used sometimes by psychiatrists. This is based on a study from 2009, where 72% of patients receiving nabilol experienced cessation or improvement of nightmares. Another study in 2004, very small study, 10 patients only, uh, and the patients received uh, five milligrams of uh, Delta 9 THC twice a day. So this is again, a very small dose. Uh, and these patients were observed to have improvement in uh, global symptom severity, sleep quality, frequency of nightmares, uh, and hyperarousal. The, uh, the MAPS study that uh, probably some of you have heard, uh, this was a study approved by FDA uh, and, uh, and financed by, um, by National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, actually, it took a long time to publish the data. They completed data collection in February of 2019 and finished uh, and reported the data just earlier this year. Uh, and the interesting thing about these data is that uh, uh, in patients with, uh, it was a relatively small study, uh, patients were in a randomized to placebo, high THC, high CBD, or uh, CBD and THC. At the end of the day, there were no differences between the groups. So um, I, the question, of course, continues to be whether smoke cannabis helps uh, patients with PTSD. However, that uh, even before the study started, there was a major problem uh, with the cannabis that was provided to the patients, which the investigators uh, investigators felt it was of very low quality and much below the quality that is delivered by dispensaries in in some of the western state. This uh, this product was uh, provided from the uh, medical cannabis program at uh, at uh, Mississippi University of Mississippi in Oxford. Uh, that program was started in 1968 and it still uh, supplies studies with uh, medical cannabis, studies that are um, funded by um, National Institutes of Drug Abuse and National Institute of Health in general. Finding schizophrenia and other psychosis. So of course, there's a question, um, uh, does cannabis cause schizophrenia or can cannabis be used for the treatment of schizophrenia? And of course, it depends on how you look at this. Uh, clearly, uh, I would say that um, there is increasing evidence in support of the use of cannabidiol as an effective treatment for the mental health outcomes in, in individuals with schizophrenia. So there are two major randomized controlled trials that were published uh, since, the, since the report. Uh, one, uh, in one study, the patients received CBD, 60 milligrams per day. This is a relatively small dose versus placebo. And they looked at the brain imaging in these patients and clearly showed positive effects. Um, and in study number two, uh, patients received 1,000 milligrams of CBD daily or placebo for six weeks, and they looked at multiple measures that showed improvement of, including uh, improvement of positive psychotic symptoms. Uh, and the global functioning scale uh, and the adverse events were similar to placebo. So uh, overall, CBD studies show likely effect in treatment of uh, psychosis and schizophrenia but those are short-term effects. We don't know whether the long-term effects are present. We also need to be uh, very careful about uh, the issue of psychosis and THC. So when you look at psychosis, the psychosis may be, of course, uh, very early um, and then may last for uh, hours, days, or weeks. And uh, it may continue uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, this, the recovery may be, of course, immediate or delayed it may be, uh, take hours, days, or weeks. And of course, the, uh, the present psychosis may require intervention. And there's of course a lot of uh, data uh, about the potential for uh, THC causing psychosis or psychosis-like symptoms. Uh, and some of the studies support that it may be the culprit. However, the data are not that great. So uh, we can't st state with 100% certainty that THC does or does not cause uh, psychosis-like symptoms. 
However, in my patient who took the pure Delta H, uh, uh, THC oil, um, there was a clear worsening of seizures and psychotic-like behavior. So, of course, the question is, does, did this cause it or is it his trait? And I don't know that, that answer to that. Finally, what is missing? So, the missing uh, aspects are the Crohn's disease. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Uh, but Crohn's disease is very important, and fibromyalgia is uh, important as well. Those are the data that are missing from the, from the report. Crohn's disease is part of the um, um, uh, Alabama medical cannabis law. Fibromyalgia is not, but uh, fibromyalgia frequently falls under chronic pain. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So uh, there's clear data uh, for support of the use of um, uh, medical cannabis for the treatment of, uh, of fibromyalgia, the symptoms associated with fibromyalgia. So this was a study of 40 patients done uh, now uh, 13 years ago. Very, very small dose of nabilone, one milligram twice a day, which is a very, very small dose, uh, versus placebo. And there was a clear improvement in the impact questionnaire, so how the uh, fibromyalgia uh, affects the patients, clear improvement in pain, and clear improvement in anxiety. What is important is that uh, at four weeks, uh, the treatment was stopped and there was a rebound of symptoms. We talked about it in the beginning, uh, that then uh, psychiatric symptoms may rebound and uh, uh, that, uh, they may get worse. And that's what you see here in anxiety, in pain, and in the uh, fibromyalgia questionnaire. So both um, there's improvement and what worsening when you stop. Clearly both of them uh, suggested that that uh, there is some efficacy of uh, at least nabilone for the treatment of fibromyalgia. Uh, there's a national uh, fibromyalgia um, survey that looked at the effic efficacy of the uh, currently available treatments. Um, about 8% of uh, patients who receive Cymbalta uh, feel it's very effective and some 32% it helps a little. So about 40% of patients have some improvement with Cymbalta. You see 39% uh, with some improvement uh, with uh, pregabalin or Lyrica. Uh, another 20, 32% of uh, some improvement with uh, Savella. And when you look at medical cannabis, uh, only 5% of patients have no improvement. So 95% of patients report some improvement. So are they really data in support of that? And the, the answer is yes. This is a study that was published in 2019 um, that looked prospectively at 367 patients with fibromyalgia, 82% of them women, and they looked at six-month response uh, rate. Various products, depending on what the patient uh, had access to, this is a study from Israel, always recommended, but they're provided. There was no fixed dose or fixed product, so patients were adjusting the dose and were uh, um, uh, working between different products to uh, see what actually works best for them. The pain intensity scale reduced from 9 out of 10 maximum to 5 out of 10. So basically, the, the pain intensity was half. And you can see that the um, majority of patients re reported some improvement. Very few patients reported no change. And uh, there was no deterioration of symptoms. When you look at actually where the patients were before and after treatment, uh, Red is before treatment, and blue is after treatment. Clear shift to patients who report um, mild to moderate pain versus severe pain here. Finally, Crohn's disease. Uh, the data are very limited. Uh, many patients uh, and many reports uh, in, on, a, on a web uh, report that, uh, that patients used uh, medical cannabis and said some improvements of cramps, diarrhea, or uh, better appetite. Um, there is also improvement in quality of life. So this is, an, again, another Israeli study published late last year, randomized controlled trials. 32 patients received either cannabis uh, cigarettes or placebo cigarettes, uh, and they looked at quality of life, and also they looked at uh, the um, um, uh, colonoscopy in these patients to uh, look at the endoscopic changes. So there was clear improvement in quality of life, but there was no difference uh, between the groups of placebo and, and uh, uh, cannabis in a change in the, in the um, colon mucosa. 
So finally, the, uh, the uh, medical cannabis law in, in Alabama. So again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit late and uh, a little bit uh, only a little bit and how it is implemented. I'm going to most mostly talk about the physician certification because I don't uh, I believe any of you are interested in producing or how to obtain a permit or how to uh, uh, build a dispensary. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, physicians will have to um, register. Um, and they will, uh, the, the physicians who are allowed to register, they have to have active license in the, to practice in the medicine in the state of Alabama. They do have to complete a four-hour course and take an exam. It's going to cost up to $500. They um, have to pay the initial registrations. There's an additional $300. And they, they will have to requalify every two years. So take a refresher course and uh, renew their license. And the uh, Alabama BME may... Um, Board of Medical Examiners may establish additional requirements. Um, there's a list of things that the certifying physician may not do. The list is very long. It's, it's over a page long. The important thing is that the patient, that the physician cannot advertise their service except for displaying a um, um, uh, information in their office. The Dr. X, which would be Dr. Saflarski in this case, is qualified by the state of Alabama to certify patients for medical cannabis use under the Alabama Compassion Act. Uh, the rules for this need to be adopted uh, by December 1st, and we are way on, on the way to do that. Uh, I'm part of the, um, uh, the group that's working on, on the medical aspects of this. Uh, obviously, I have no interest in cultivation or, or dispensaries, uh, but uh, we believe that we uh, will be able to meet this requirement. Um, what, what are the rules? Uh, the requirement, is, there is a requirement for patient examination and establishment of patient physician relationship. So, uh, really it, there has to be a physician patient relationship. We can't just say, okay, go ahead and, and get some medical cannabis. Um, there is a requirement for relevant medical information that needs to be included in the patient record. Uh, there needs to be review of the controlled substance prescription history, which uh, if, for some of you who know, there is uh, a way of uh, me looking at uh, every patient and whatever they have received from any uh, and every pharmacy in, in the state. Uh, there is there's a review for patient, uh, there's a requirement for patient uh, registry, so the physician will have to log in and review whether the patient is actually a uh, registered patient uh, or register the patient. Uh, there also needs to be a consent form. Uh, the patient will need to sign that. Uh, and um, the, the medical license will need to be reissued periodically uh, uh, so that the duration of the, the patient will be able to hold the licenses for a maximum of 12 months. The starting dose uh, per day should not ex exceed 50 milligrams per day of Delta-9 THC. This is actually a large dose. As, as you uh, may recall from the studies, the patients uh, typically receive somewhere between one and 10, one and 20 milligrams of Delta-9 THC. So this is actually a large dose. They will be able to obtain maximum two months supply. They will have to, uh, they, they may be able to have on hand up to 70 days supply of medical cannabis. There, if, if the dose of 50 milligrams uh, seems to be ineffective, the dose may be increased after 90 days of continued care from uh, 50 to 75 milligrams, and it may be increased later to more than 75 milligrams per, uh, per day. However, in those cases, the patient will be notified their driving license will be suspended. For minors uh, who uh, receive medical cannabis, the maximum will be 3% of Delta-9 THC. Um, and then, of course, uh, there is the patient registry uh, and who uh, can access the patient registry, including the law enforcement, uh, healthcare providers, um, um, pharmacists, uh, dispensaries, etc. So, um, uh, for those who are interested, I'm working on establishing a medical cannabis clinic at UAB, and I'm hoping to have it actually available. Uh, sometime uh, late next year, uh, provided we uh, the, the Medical Cannabis Commission can actually get everything done and implemented during that period of time. Uh, however, the medical cannabis is not covered by insurance, so patients will need to uh, uh, pay for it out of pocket. There's no prescription. It 
will be recommendations. So uh, the patient will be uh, will receive medical cannabis card and recommendation to use the medical cannabis, and they will have to go to the dispensary and purchase it. Uh, we will be collecting a lot of data. So at least at UAB, we'll try to do this do this as a research program. And there is uh, also a consortium for medical cannabis research that will be led by um, presidents of major uh, uh, educational institutions in the state of uh, Alabama uh, to develop research uh, of medical cannabis. Um, and I think this is this is the end. So just to summarize, uh, cannabis can be used as a medicine if it's used uh, 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 thoughtfully. There are many conditions where it can help. And uh, um, the Alabama law is being implemented. And like I said, I'm hoping to have can medical cannabis available in late next year. And I think that's the end. So I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jersey. Very, very informative. Um, I've learned, I learned a lot, uh, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I talk very fast, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, lot to, a lot to tell. And, yeah, no. The, um, I started the recording a little bit after uh, the my introduction, so it'll be available for people. If you agree, it'll be available uh, for watch offline after it's been put up. So, uh, without further ado, any any questions for Doctor Zaflarsky? Feel free to unmute and ask questions, or send them in the chat. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> Go ahead. How will you decide um, to, for epilepsy patients when to prescribe medical marijuana or epidiolex? Okay, I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. It's a very important question. Uh, I believe at least in, in the cases of epilepsy, we do have an uh, approved uh, medical cannabis product. So at least in my case, I will uh, try to prescribe this first and see whether it's effective or not, because this product is very stable and very well characterized. If the patient doesn't have the desired response, that will be the point where I will say, well, you know, maybe we should try medical cannabis, something like one uh, to 20 THC CBD or maybe one to 50 THC CBD uh, and see whether this works better. Um, but uh, my, my, at least for patients with epilepsy, my first response will be, let's try Epidiolex. Uh, if, uh, if, um, uh, Sativex uh, or the Nabiximals becomes available in the U.S. at some point. Uh, that this that will be the same situation for MS, this plasticity in, in MS, for example, or spinal cord injury, uh, where I will I would say I will recommend this first, and if it's not working, then we can go and start um, adjusting the the proportion of THC to CBD. But if there is a approved FDA approved product, uh, I believe, especially the medical cannabis product, uh, I believe we should start it first or try it first. If there is no desirable effect or the, the, the effect is uh, uh, not, not sufficient, then of course we can try uh, the medical cannabis. But for, other, uh, for multiple other conditions, there's really no approved product. So it will be sort of the standard medical therapies don't work. Um, why not try medical cannabis? Thank you. I'm just bracing for all the patients <laughs> asking about it. There's a question in the chat from Maria. Do uh, you want to unmute or we can read it? Uh, patient pe personality. Uh, obviously, if somebody has a history of mood problems, depression, or they have history of psychosis, uh, we do need to be very careful and, uh, and uh, decide whether the patient should or should not have products that contain THC, for example. Uh, also, um, uh, patient personality may uh, determine the response to the product that they are receiving. Um, how this exactly work, and if there is a specific personality that predisposes the patient to this respond to the product in a very specific way. Unfortunately, the, there's, the data are not sufficient. So it's a matter of trying and starting somewhere. So if somebody has, let's say, depression and um, they have bouts of, of severe depression, uh, my, my recommendation would be to start with, uh, with uh, acute treatments, like in that um, um, uh, study from, that I um, discussed uh, with about 2,000 patients, 6,000 doses, uh, and see how this works for that patient. Um, 
you know, if somebody has anxiety, of course, uh, the, the first treatment will be mostly CBD rather than THC because THC can cause anxiety, uh, especially at the higher doses. So again, it will be determined by uh, the, the entire um, uh, personality makeup of the patient and their, uh, their comorbidities rather than uh, um, just sort of a um, cookie cutter approach that it's, that it's not gonna work for, for medical cannabis. I have a very quick question. I, I wasn't aware of the studies uh, on autism. So do you know if those studies looked at the um, severity of the, of the autism uh, uh, presentation symptoms and correlated the severity uh, with the beneficial effects? So uh, the, again, the, 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 the the studies uh, show that uh, that medical cannabis, in general, is effective for treatment of symptoms associated with with autism, especially the behavior, uh, behavioral problems, um, uh, and uh, in the, even uh, in studies with epilepsy, where medical cannabis was used, uh, many patients with epilepsy uh, have autism, uh, and we saw some improvement of those symptoms. So there's a there's an improvement of symptoms with uh, with a substantial proportion of patients having. Uh, 50, 60, 70 percent of uh, improvement in their symptoms. Um, however, again, this will be uh, probably dependent on the dose and, and the patient makeup and what exactly you are treating. There's a um, study at NYU uh, going on of uh, highly purified cannabidiol for the treatment of, of uh, autism. I think we'll have a good answer from the trial, but uh, again, this is not published yet. Great, thank you. Any any other questions or comments uh, for Dr. Saflarski? Okay. Uh, if not, I don't want to hold um, anybody for longer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saflarski. This was extremely uh, informative, um, and we'll be posting this. Uh, as soon as it's uh, all um, arranged, uh, it will be posted on the CNC website and we'll make sure that um, the list of, uh, uh, of emails on the audience are, are receiving the, the link to that. Uh, please remember to uh, uh, check the CNC website for upcoming neuroscience cafes and spread the word. Uh, send us uh, new uh, uh, interested persons to be included in this list. And, and with that, then I thank you everybody for your time. Thanks again, Jersey. For a thank great you, everyone. Talk. Good night. Good night.